Thank you very much. And good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Thank you for taking the time to join our um, exciting webinar today, Decode Real World Data Opportunities in Rare Diseases. We also thank you already in advance to participate actively into this webinar. Please post your questions, comments into the chat. If we miss something, we will reach out afterwards to you. So please, please be uh, very active and interactive. So we have a wonderful panel here with senior executives working in the rare disease space since quite some time. And we do a super short introduction um, and, and then go immediately into the topic. So I will start with Jill. Jill is a biologist by education with a specialization in immunology and molecular virology. Have been working in data analysis for healthcare industry for almost 30 years and currently manage the real world data activity for the Sagedim group. Jill, what motivates you particularly um, in the rare disease space? Just one sentence. Yeah, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, good morning to everyone. So uh, at Sagedim it is data, especially uh, as regard uh, rare disease, as a data collection is one of our key, key topics. We've seen our longitudinal real world database. We already have hundreds of patients with patient characteristics, clinical outcomes, and also more than seven years of back data by patient. The second point is how to transform real world data into action by developing patient support program, rare disease detection program, uh, patient pathway uh, uh, improvement program, combining real world data and advanced analytics or artificial uh, intelligence. We already have several uh, uh, ongoing programs. Okay. Okay. Thank you, um, Gilles. Sonal. Sonal is an MD and internist, currently the chief medical officer for rare diseases at Pfizer. She has been in industry for 17 years. Sonal, Sonal what is your driver? For me, I think it's very important as we think about real world evidence and rare disease patients to get access. And I think that is the most important end goal where every patient has access to our medicines. And there's so many hurdles we have to go through that allow us to get, garner them access. And for that, real world evidence can be a very strong pillar as we think about our regulators and our payers. Thank you, Zonal. Over to Jackie. Jackie received her MPH um, with a concentration in epidemiology and biostatistics from Tufts University. And she began her career um, in the more in the vendor space and transitioned then into pharmaceutical industry. She's now with Alexion since seven years, heading up the patient population forecasting group. Jackie, how about your drivers? Oh, thank you very much and good morning, good afternoon to everyone. I think one of the things that I am most passionate about is understanding diversity in the rare disease patient populations and understanding how using various data sources, we can strive to have a diverse patient population in our trials and in our treated populations as we would expect to see in the general population. Thank you, highly appreciate it. Omar, over to you. Omar is an MD and MPH um, and working in biotech and pharma since nearly 30 years in executive levels. He worked on pharmaceuticals, medical devices, and most recently also in gene therapy and initiated several disease and product registries. Omar, tell us about your drivers. Omar, you may have, please unmute yourself. You are still on mute. Sorry. Yeah, no, all good. Good morning and good afternoon. Apologies for my voice. <laughs> I was diagnosed with COVID four days ago, but I didn't want to miss today's webinar. Uh, my drivers in the space of rare diseases is that this is a group of about 7,000 diseases. For lots of them, we don't have therapy. And it's not like we've forgotten about those uh, diseases and those patients and their families. It's just technologies probably wasn't available to deliver therapies that would make a difference in their lives. <clears throat> I'm driven by the opportunity to bring treatments for conditions that 
some fatal, some debilitating, and uh, costly. We want to make sure that we have the right data. Uh, typically, we come and we go to regulators with incomplete data for various reasons in rare diseases. How can we supplement and complement that data? Is by looking at other data sources outside of clinical trials, such as real world data. <clears throat> I'm excited about the opportunity now that regulators are looking at real world data, also payers, access. They're looking at real world data to support early access to those therapies. I'm gonna stop here and happy to answer questions. Yes, we will go into depth in a few seconds. Thank you very much, Omar. So to break the virtual ice, we have prepared a short poll um, and um, it will appear on the screen in a second. So, and the question is, do you think that rare can pave the way for higher acceptance of RWE use in general? So I give you a few seconds, please answer. Few more seconds to go. Okay, I, I think we have a good picture. So the majority is that it will enhance acceptance, but it's still a way to go. Um, and I think um, I personally would agree, but I want to hear for sure from the panel. Probably so now can I hand over to you what you think from your experience in the rare disease space within a large organization. Can RWE use case from rare really enlarge, trigger and enhance non-rare areas? What the question was to? Susanal. Okay. And the others jump in afterwards. I just saw that um, coming, uh, her coming from a big organization, she may have a good intro comment on that. Yes, no, I think it's it's a very um, great question. We are really paving our the pathway on how we interact with regulators and what is needed from a real world evidence perspective. And, and quite frankly, as you think about the last five years, I would say maybe seven to eight years, the regulators are starting to look at real world evidence as something very critical as part of the dossier. Um, and you know, the FDA just recently last year has also enhanced their, their guidances. They've published three guidances. There's more coming their way. They're starting to talk about data quality, um, the type of data that is that you can submit, how you can submit it, and its impact on the regulatory pathway. And similarly, the EMA is doing the same. So I think in a rare disease world, we are treading in a positive direction in order to be able to garner um, approvals that take into account real world evidence. And this wasn't the case if you think about 10, 15 years ago. So there's a lot of change that's happening now. And I expect that over the next decade or less, that a lot more is going to move forward because of colleagues like ourselves and our peers in industry, we're all driving towards the same motivator, right? Which is how do we utilize real world evidence in a way that is going to enhance um, the understanding of our medicine, the effectiveness and its safety um, so that patients can have the right medicine and the right choice for their diseases. Yes, thank you very much, Dunal. Omar, you wanted to, to um, comment on that as well, or the others want to jump in? I could say a couple of things here. The quality of the data and data collections is improving daily. And thanks for lots of organizations who are leading that. From the perspective of biotech and pharmaceuticals, uh, we are still behind and we always look at the return and the investment we make in the space. We should be more supportive of collecting such data. Having said this, there are some political issues that we need to pay attention to in rare diseases, where 
different stakeholders might see different benefits from collecting data. And it makes sense to sit down whenever you're developing or you start to think of developing a product in rare diseases, bring those stakeholders to, to the table and have a, a, a discussion with them and be clear on the objectives of why you want access to that data and how you can work with them. Irrespective of that, it's going to remain very difficult to collect data in rare diseases because of those political issues. So it's important to do that. Also, it's important to start a dialogue with regulators, with payers early on. What makes sense for from their perspective? What is it that they want to see? So there are issues related to study designs at the beginning. If I'm running a study, single arm study, I'm going to make the comparison. How can I show the efficacy and safety of the product if I have 10 patients or eight or 15, right? So natural history is very important, but those studies have to be designed in such ways that regulators, payers, uh, scientists don't raise lots of issues and trash them so they can be valid to go and support regulatory submissions, payer submissions, story development. So that is very important. Also, need to have a mechanism to collect that data for rare diseases to help address issues around uncertainty. Uncertainty is not only about the safety. In the space of gene therapy for one dose, is that enough for the life, rest of the life of the patient? How can we demonstrate that when you go to regulators or payers and you say I have data in five years. So what pay, payment uh, outcomes uh, based contracting we want to put in place and how we're going to get the data. So I see lots of opportunities for uh, data, real world data collection in the space of rare diseases. We just have to be very thoughtful and careful how to approach it and why we're doing it. Thank you, Omar. And, you know, we jumped already immediately into the operational part, how challenging it is to get data of high quality fit for purpose and to, uh, to operationalize this. And um, oftentimes we are, we are discussing also GDPR and in particular in the rare disease space when we have signal cases which, which are traceable, data collection is even more limited and very strict regulated in certain countries. Jill, you want to probably comment on this one? Uh, yes, uh, uh, of course. It's always a, a balance between the, the precision expected by researcher and um, the data protection required by, by the law. So at, at, at the end, we have to aggregate the data uh, uh, and the result is to lose pr pre precision. So it's always a, a, a balance. So we uh, um, the, the way we decided to, uh, um, uh, to, to change uh, the world of, of real world data is to start working with primary care and uh, to enroll and involve the uh, HCPs and, 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 and patient. As mentioned by Omar, the data collection is, is really key to improve the, uh, the, the quality uh, at the end. So to enroll a maximum of uh, primary care physician in Europe, to collect the maximum of patients, to demonstrate the value for HCPs and patients, and especially for HCP, to complete the, the data, because we need more and more data to be able to build a, a, a big a cube of data with patient characteristic and clinical outcome with a maximum of back, of back data. So that the reason why in Europe, for example, we are close to 10,000 physicians in the, in, in the network. And the idea is also to work and to improve the, the coding and the structuring database, just to be able to build a European cohort. Because otherwise, when we work country by country, sometimes the number of patients is below the, uh, the, the requirement from the, uh, from the law. So, uh, just to give you an, an example, in Belgium, it's totally forbidden to collect uh, secondary data uh, for rare disease. So 
uh, this country is the perfect example why we need a European database. So, you know, solution is to improve the number of patients, so through a huge network, and to demonstrate the value to HTTP to complete and to improve the quality of the data. Thank you, Jill. Jackie, you want to comment on that as well? Yes, thank you very much. So I think speaking from the epidemiology perspective, we're taught from day one of epidemiology school to go to the literature, to go to the literature, do a systematic literature review and find out everything you can about a disease. However, when we're working in the rare disease space, we don't always have that luxury because there aren't you know, a, a slew of natural history studies that have been written. There aren't a lot of other drugs on the market where we can go and look at what their outcomes were and how did they measure. So in these cases, specifically working with rare disease, we have to get creative. And that in that way, it means developing registries. It means forming collaborations with other organizations to work together with some of their data and going to other data sources and just like Omar said, you have to be very careful and very thoughtful right from the beginning, because in a lot of ways, you're creating the database for a particular rare disease upon which patients and caregivers rely as a means of getting these drugs approved. And I think we're seeing regulators start to accept and understand that particularly in the rare disease space, we have to create these data and these data analytics for ourselves. You know, we can't just go and pull down all of the published literature because in many cases we're developing all of that published literature. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Go ahead, I, I just I wanted to comment on, on Jackie's point because it's very important, I think, to recognize that we need to be the creators of this data. Um, but I also wanted to point out that the assumption is a clinical trial succeeds and we're looking, garnering the data to help support their utility. But it's also very important to think about a failed trial because when you're um, actually going through the journey um, from a patient's lens and creating a trial and getting to the endpoint and it fails or it just doesn't meet that endpoint that you had thought of, that data that you've collected is so important for the disease space. And often we just put it aside and we move on to the next disease or the next clinical trial, but there's a lot of clues within the data that's been collected through that journey that becomes very important to share and collaborate with, with, with ourselves, with our peers in pharma, with patient advocacy groups, because it's gonna inform how to design that next trial that could be the holy grail for the one study that meets the need for the patient. And we are the ones with the hope. They're looking at us with hope for the one trial that succeeds so we can get them the access. So I think it's very important to keep that perspective in mind as well. I think it's a super important point to really have this sharing of data. And we also all know that the era that small clinical registries lumping together is not anymore accepted. We know the draft guidance is from FDA. So from your perspective, and, and Sonal, you said very nicely, we are the creator of the data. So what is, for, for, from your thinking from the panel, the best approach? Should we um, collaborate with patient advocacy groups? Should we, should we be the centralized owner of the data? What are your takes, pros and cons for different approaches? You know, I think broadly speaking, I would say one size does not fit all in this case. I think every disease will have unique needs. There are some ultra rare diseases where quite frankly, collaboration is gonna be key because without that, you will continue to have very small sizes of data and they will not be the full pieces of the puzzle put together. And so when you think about a patient's disease and their journey, it's a puzzle. Um, if we can all provide that one piece, we solve the puzzle for them and we get them access. There are larger, uh, quote unquote, larger rare diseases where you can have different data sets, broad data sets, maybe one in US, maybe one in Europe, depending on patient populations, large enough that you can start to do sub-analysis on them. And, and for those, maybe you don't need that collaboration because they're large enough to be able to do sub-analysis and understand the data, but I think when it comes to the collection of it in particular, 
um, patients, patient advocacy groups are critical. Um, I, at the end of the day, our patients dictate the type of endpoints we want. So without understanding their lens and what they're seeking to improve their disease, then we're just creating what we think is right for them and it may not be what they want. So I think the patient's voice is in that early journey, the natural history um, element that Jackie mentioned, their voice starts right there. They're the ones who understand their disease even more so than we do and definitely more than physicians, they, have, they live it every day. And so the data with the patients and the patient advocacy groups, the collaboration with them, and quite frankly, it depends if you're owning it. Sometimes if a, if a patient advocacy group owns a data set with all of the pharma companies, it's, it's a wonderful way to, uh, to generate data, right? But at the end of the day also, who pays for it? How do we get the money together? That's always another challenge that I'm sure we've all faced. So I don't think one size fits all in that respect. Thank you, Sunal. Omar, you wanted to comment as well? Uh, I would like to echo what uh, Sunal just said. Uh, I was in a meeting and uh, one of the parents of the patients in spinal muscular atrophy said, the most important uh, outcomes for me is when I'm home with my son, working on my computer, and every five minutes, my son screams for me to scratch his head. If a medication can help with that, for me, that's an immense improvement. Not only for my son, but for the entire family take care of our son 24 seven. And we cannot drop everything every few minutes to go scratch his head or face. So <clears throat> speaking with patients is key. What is important to patients? And that's what I mentioned earlier, the early communications with the stakeholders, the uh, regulators, the payers, the patients, bring them all if you can to do the same room and I agree. We don't have all the tools that capture all the outcomes of value. So let's go back and put the patients in the center of what we're doing. Because we could put any story we want, for any product, it will not hold value if we don't bring value to that patient. It's costly, it's difficult. Uh, sometimes you go home and you scream by yourself why those people don't understand what we're trying to do. It takes patience and it takes dedication and it's costly. That's why I said, be very clear on what the objectives are. But the cost will come back. You'll make it by seeing patients improving changing their lives, transforming the lives of the caregivers who are taking care of those patients. Thank you. And before we move on, we have several questions in the chat. One was um, on, on what is rare. Rare is defined slightly different across geographies. Maybe one in um, 1,500, one in 2,000, one, um, less than 50,000. So it depends on the um, regions a little bit. But I think a very closely related question to that, which I actually also had in my mind, is um, in the chat um, on geographical differences. So um, do, how do you see differences in real world evidence generation for rare in different uh, regions like US, Europe, or um, can you comment on anything of that? I think there, there's definitely differences in how you collect data. Every geography certainly does it different. I can for example, in US, we, we didn't have consistent EMRs a decade plus ago. That, that's just started to happen now. Now we generate data so easily with, through EMRs before it was chart reviews. So, um, and that really wasn't that long ago when you think about it. Um, similarly, across the globe, I think there's a lot of advanced techniques on how to generate, collect data. I know in Europe, in the Nordics, they've just got unbelievable advanced ways of, of 
collecting the data and it's robust, it's cohesive. You can actually go in and, and do a lot of analysis, even identify potential um, future label expansions um, just based on that without having to run a phase four trial. So I think there are definitely differences. Nobody's the same. However, I, the more we share with each other, the more learnings we'll have and the better we're all gonna get at. And maybe in a decade, we can all say, we're all similarly advanced in how we're collecting data and maintaining it and the value that it provides because data is can be huge, very big. Um, but what do you do with it? How do you go through it, hone in on what your research question is and how do you answer it? You can get lost in it, right? So it becomes then even more important as you're generating quality data to actually know what it is your intent is and what you want to be able to answer. Thank you. And a um, related question actually, which we touched base briefly before is also, what are the real trusted partners? I think on, for those of us who are in pharma industry, we know that we are probably not the most trusted partners, but in rare it may change because patients uh, have an unmet medical need. So that mm -hmm. may be slightly different. We also discuss often yeah, uh, what, which play does patient advocacy groups to play or should be a completely neutral party who runs this data collection. So um, Andrea, thank, for, thank you for um, raising this in the chat. Um, the panel, do you want to, um, anybody to comment on this, on the trusted partnership? I can, I can certainly take a first stab at that. Thank you. Um, so I think this goes back to the whole idea of patient centricity. Right. And in the rare disease space, it's even more important for the pharmaceutical industry to strive to be a trusted partner, because in a lot of cases, we may be, you know, sort of the only thing they have in terms of trying to get from a current state with unmet medical need to get to a state where, as Omar was talking about, where just their, their everyday basic living functions can be improved. And I think working with patient advocacy groups and working with patients all the way back to the beginning of their diagnostic journey, understand, did it take them seven, 10 years to be diagnosed with the correct disease before they can even think about getting the most relevant treatment? You know, what is their diagnostic journey? What did they have to go to, go through to even, you know, get to our doorstep? And then making sure that they're involved and that their voices are heard. If we hear people, if we listen to people, then they will they will learn hopefully to come to us and to trust us a little bit more. And I think that's essential in the rare disease space because there's not a lot of voices and there's not a lot of, um, there's not a lot of avenues for these patients to feel like they're being heard. So I think patient centricity is absolutely number one. And that's the way to get patients to come to the pharmaceutical industry, to trust the pharmaceutical industry and you know, to help us help them. Thank you. And I think related, there was a question in the chat, which role could CROs play in this? Because if pharma companies are trying to connect directly with the patient or patient advocacy groups, how does then the, the CROs come into play? And thank you. I, I think it was uh, Salvador who I raised this question. Any ideas from your side? Are you working with CROs or do you um, take this completely internally in your companies? Uh, maybe I can talk about this. <laughs> so we work with CROs uh, and that is important because it goes back to trust in pharmaceuticals, right? Uh, one of the things that <clears throat> pharma would like to do is work with CROs because those are an independent third party agency. And uh, they're the ones who help in the data capture. Uh, they're the ones who help in protecting the data, uh, putting it in servers, analyzing, and put some validation tools around the collection, the development of analytical files, statistical interpretation, but also working with key opinion leaders in the space who can come and be partners 
in those data collections. We need their input. We need uh, their help in addressing uh, difficult uh, questions uh, and being proactive and looking for uh, new ways of helping the patients. But also uh, keep the connection with the advocacy groups and the patients because they also have questions. If we don't answer their questions, they will not trust us. So uh, CROs are essential in that role. And in some countries, you've heard from Jill and others that we can collect data in Europe. We cannot take it out of Italy, for example. Uh, some registries, some k ones who have registries may not want to share patient level data with companies. So you need a third party to work, collaborate with, and help you. Now, the question is how to get the right CRO to help with that. And I think every company has its own criteria for, for that. So uh, this is not that the place to go there, but CROs are essential in helping us getting those data collection uh, in rare diseases up and running. Thank you very much. And let's stay a minute for the patient centricity because I see also a lot of questions in the chat on this. So I think we have um, one question going more into the direction, when should we involve patients and what are the um, steps? So, and we mentioned previously um, as early as possible. So perhaps we can tackle this question for, uh, first before we go into the outcome assessments. So what do you think, when can we engage with patients in rare disease um, and involve them? And um, do we have concrete steps um, um, how to approach that? So I can answer this along the lines of um, patient centricity. So I think as early as possible is sort of the right answer. But I agree very much with what Sanal said, that there isn't any one size fits all for these types of interactions. But I do think bringing patients along for as much of the journey as possible makes the most sense in these populations. So including patients early on to understand what are their primary unmet medical needs in their disease. Where do they see that the current treatment strategies, the standard of care is missing the mark for them in their day-to-day -day lives? What types of measures would matter to them in terms of improvement and outcomes from an, uh, from an upcoming therapy. And I think understanding all, you know, from as early as possible, right? If we, if we bring patients along when we're already you know, driving towards approval, that, that may be too late. And we may miss the opportunity to hear their voices and understand what they need. So you know, granted, you don't wanna bring them on, you know, too too early because you know a, a lot of there are a lot of hiccups along the way but as soon as you're really you know moving through the development phase fairly early on to get those patient voices of what do they need what do their caregivers need what is going to have an impact on their day-to-day -day life right because in a lot of these rare diseases that are debilitating and progressive it's not a matter of overnight curing. It's how can we help them get better day to day. Thank you. I Jill? completely agree. Uh, so now go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead, Bill. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think that the the question when is also linked to the question where. But based on our experience at the uh, at city level. The question where, when you are thinking about the primary care, the, uh, the, the getaway, the first, the, the, the first door uh, for a patient, when we are thinking about the, uh, the treatment patient pathway is very important. Say, how to improve the detection at primary care level, you know, to help the physician to detect symptoms, to, you know, to refer to specialists. So for me, where and when are, 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 really, uh, are really linked and I fully agree with Jackie as soon as possible. So, and to give the, uh, the possibility to the uh, uh, to uh, uh, GPs uh, everywhere in Europe, it, uh, it works everywhere, but to help them to, uh, to detect, uh, to help the patient and to demonstrate the value to the patient and to close the loop. 
you can the, 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 this um, approach as a, as a direct impact on the quality, the completeness, and so on. So where and when for me are linked. Thank you. And the second question into this direction was um, a lot in the chat about patient reported outcomes, patient valued outcomes, and how can we validate that um, for, so let's say, need regulatory standards, um, which is even more challenging and rare than in other diseases. Any experiences and thoughts from your side on that one? That's a tough one. <laughs> because uh, lots of those diseases, we don't know. So that work takes time, takes a couple of years to develop a tool. If you want to go get FDA uh, regulatory approval based on those PROs. And uh, for some diseases, we have instruments that can capture the important outcomes you could get FDA approval on. Now, having said this, you could develop tools, PROs to get uh, label, additional labels based on the PROs. It takes time also. But other times you want to collect data just to show that patients improve on whether they scratch their head or they speak or they can swallow or they can play good with their friends, right? So I think we also we have to have a strategy but most importantly, we need to know what is it that the product is capable to do, right? You could develop any PRO you want, but can your product address the amount needs that you will see? So it's not the egg or the chicken. What I'm saying is that we need to have a very good understanding of the condition. If there is a competition, you need to know everything that you, I mean, everything you need to know about the competition, maybe more than you need to know about your product uh, you know, equally, right? And uh, that is important. That takes time, takes lots of effort. So the question of, uh, as early as possible, uh, if you go to NICE to have a meeting with them and what their needs are, like, early conversation, discussion with nice input, insights, whatever you want to call it, they bring patients to it, right? You don't go to nice. You want to start talking about development. Put the advisory board, bring those patients, bring the physicians along with them. Bring somebody from advocacy group, ask questions. And then you devise or you, you develop the strategy and the tactics that go along. Uh, to me is you need to have a clear road map in the question where is important, when is important, why is the most important. And then the how, you have experts in every pharma and CRO, they can make things happen. Thank you. And very closely linked to that discussion is also the data sources. And there were lots of questions about this in the um, chat as well. Are electronic medical records ready to use um, to be used for this? Or are patient support programs can be used, early access programs? How can we use those data to accelerate insights into patient needs and safety, effectiveness, whatever? Any thoughts from your side? I think in this space, there are there are options to be used um, in terms of trying to you know run analyses of electronic health records, trying to run analyses even of some claims data, where you can if if you can build a robust enough cohort right because we're still talking about rare disease so you may go into um, you know a real world data source and find that you only have 10 patients but if you can if you can build yourself a robust enough cohort and you can start to probe these data sources to understand lines of therapy um, treatments how long after diagnosis is a treatment made how long does it take a patient to transition uh, from one line of therapy to another line of therapy. And I think, you know, these can be challenging, 
Um, but if you can if you can establish a robust sample size in your patient cohort, um, you know, then you can start to drill down a little bit into some of these, uh, you know, the treatment paradigm, the treatment journey, what's working, what isn't working, how long does it take a patient to cycle through um, to get to third line therapy, to get to refractory, but however you define refractory for your disease. So I think there are options, but uh, all coming back to this point of a very careful and a very thoughtful you know, analysis plan and understanding of what, you're, what question you're trying to answer and at what point um, will the data pre precision actually lead you. If I may add to that a little bit and uh, separate the data into data sources, because that's why I've heard data, data sources. So there are uh, data regulations in countries. So it's very important to understand those data regulations in countries because in Europe, you have countries that you're mandated to collect data on rare diseases. For example, in France, you have to. But how can you get access to that? Gilles can speak to this. So I like to separate the data into various data sources. We have data from insurance companies for billing purposes, which don't include symptoms, signs, lab, radiology, etc. Some are put in data there. We talk about electronic health record. We have lots of those in the US. Uh, we tried to use lots of them. We had lots of challenges. Everybody uses Epic. At the same organization, same hospital, they have different departments using different versions of that. How to make sense out of that, right? So that's another. Another data source is you have advocacy groups that have registries, physicians who have registries. You have advocacy groups, you have, they have registries. So registry is a different one. You could go and do chart reviews. You have data collected from patient perspectives. Like some CROs, they have those data. You can do surveys. You have data from clinical trials. So there are lots of data sources. I think, like uh, Jackie said, is what is the question that you want to answer? If you know a question, look at put an inventory of data sources and then find the best one mm -hmm. to do that. There's lots of data. Data is costly. So yeah. be very thoughtful. Yeah, and I think you raised a good point that we always should start with a question and then look for the right data source. Oftentimes, um, in particular, in the rare teams start, okay, let me first know which data are available and then we come up with a question and we always should push back and, and do the other way around. And when we, and that was also a question in the chat, do we use existing data enough? And I think it's also important to differentiate of what for do we need, um, use them enough. Is it for patient identification for clinical trials? Or is it to understand the patient journey, safety, effectiveness, or whatever? And another comment was nicely uh, framed that do we have blind spots? Are there data sources which we probably overuse or underuse? Let's say inpatient, outpatient data. So uh, is there, comes, uh, comes, does a systematic bias comes to your mind immediately that you say, yeah, we may not, um, we may overuse or underuse certain data sources? Or do you think like Omar just um, raised it's so heterogeneous and we, we, have, we have the coverage? So now. I would say it is heterogeneous, but I also think it's individual. Um, you, whoever is running the analysis is going to go to a source that they're comfortable with, that they are they have depth and knowledge in, or if you're using a vendor, they will have certain access to data sources and they're going to use utilize what's, what's in their domain. So I don't know if we can say uh, which one's right or wrong, because I completely agree. When you're thinking holistically about what is the, the challenge or the problem you're trying to solve, you're going to then go and find different sources of data. But if you're just saying, I have this EMR data, what can I find? I think then you're just going down a forest, right? And it's, it's very hard to then really address the challenges we have for patients. But I think, I know we've talked a lot about prospective data and retrospective and chart reviews. And I, I'm starting to realize that 
those are very traditional ways of generating data. But now there's a new element, which is the digital component, mm -hmm. right? And I want to just overlay digital for a second onto real world evidence. And I think we're starting to realize that there's so much we can do automating um, how we generate this data faster. The whole idea here is try to fast do your clinical trials faster. Try to be able to get to that access faster, get the patients, the products in a regulatory chain much faster. But what about the physician who wants to, um, has all these patients, how do they reduce the time that it takes to actually diagnose a patient? Sometimes it can be seven, 10, 15 years in the rare disease world. How can we do that faster for them? And I think that's where artificial intelligence, machine learning, modeling techniques, um, overlaying onto real world evidence are gonna give us that ability to take all these great epic um, platforms that exist, utilize an algorithm, plug them in, and to be able to tell a patient, a physician, there may be seven patients here that you've not thought of in this, in this disease area that's rare, hence why they're missed, and potentially go down a diagnostic pathway to diagnose these patients earlier. And once you do that, if there's a medicine, you're connecting dots at the end of the for a patient at the end of their journey much faster. So I'm excited to see that come to fruition. And I know many pharma companies are working to figure out how to do it. I don't know if we can answer the how yet, but we know where we wanna go and we're all trying to do it in different ways. And the more we share with each other, the faster we're gonna to get to that solution. Yeah, thank you very much. And for the last few minutes, I really would like to go one level up on the more organizational part, because we also have some questions and comments on that in the chat. So from an organizational structure, there may are different approaches for rare. Some may say, oh, it's not very different to other these non-rare diseases. So it's exactly set up as the rest of the company. Others say, no, there, um, it has to be a completely different setup. Others may even make a spin-off out of it. So what is your take on um, what the advantages and disadvantages are and any thoughts on what an ad ideal RWE team in the rare space would look like? Well, I can speak to the way we do it at Pfizer, right? So we have, we have different business units and it, um, I'm in the rare disease business unit, of course, and there's others. We also have a patient health and value impact group that runs a lot of the real world evidence work for all of the business units. So they serve as a platform. But internally, we also have a few expertise within our rare disease and we bring those in or we partner with them it's, um, outside of our business unit to be able to deliver on the methodology or if we have a question, where can we get that access? So we have, I would say ours is more of a hybrid model. It's not in or out, and you get to select what's best for the type of solution you're seeking. And when we come back to the initial discussion that we said, um, where can we and uh, can pave the way for real world evidence acceptance? Do you think then that it is, um, if it's an own business unit, um, it's better or hybrid or separate? Any thoughts on that? I think having it in our own business unit for that particular answer is critical because we understand the regulatory dynamics, the challenges, the hurdles. It's not an 18,000 um, patient trial that's easy to go through, right? So that's where the expertise of the internal rare disease franchise allows us to partner with our payers and our regu regulators and, and you know unlock that potential that we have. I don't think we could have done that. And I know in the past we weren't in these business units, we weren't thinking that way. We were thinking one size fits all. And once again, in, in every therapeutic area in industry, one size doesn't fit. But even in rare, there are so many different types of diseases that you have to look at each one individually. Yeah. Jackie, you wanted to comment on this as well? Um, so I very much want to echo um, Sonal's points and, and that's 
very much aligned with how we do it also. The rare disease, Alexianus, the rare disease business unit does operate fairly autonomously. And I think the reason for that is number one, you know, we have the expertise in rare disease. You know, we've been in rare disease for you know decades at this point. So, you know, we have sort of that expertise in how to go about conducting a clinical trial, how to go about looking at real world evidence, when to bring in, you know, particular therapeutic area experts, right? Because not only are we rare disease, but we may be rare disease in hematology or rare disease in nephrology, right? So you need that rare disease expertise, but then you also need the therapeutic area overlay into the rare disease. And I think this also comes into play with how we look at verbal data you know, um, very much like others have said on the panel, you know, we start with a committee and we launch the question, what are we trying to answer? And then with all of these heads together from the rare disease business unit, you know, we come up with ideas of which data sources, maybe there's a vendor, maybe there's a particular, um, you know, statistician or programmer that has answered a similar question for another disease. And so we fine tune all within the rare disease business unit, we fine tune how we're going to go about answering each question. And I think the whole reason for that is, again, we're going to have a very small population. It's not like, you know, I say this all the time to folks internally, you know, we're not running an analysis on dyslipidemia or type 2 diabetes. You know, we're running an analysis where there may only be 2,000 patients in the United States. The entire thought process through execution, through delivery has to be completely different. And I think by keeping the rare disease business units as sort of you know, standalone or, um, or pillars within the organization, you can accomplish that. Thank you. Um, I don't know. Um, I think we are running a little bit out of time. So thank you very much for the active participation. I hope we will get access to the chat um, uh, comments so that we will, can reach out to you as well. So I will briefly summarize uh, what I heard. So, uh, and uh, what really makes me super happy to see is that we have obviously all the same goal. I think that was very consistent with messaging. We want to bring treatments for severe costly diseases to patients. We want to better understand the diversity of the rare disease populations. Um, we, we think that RWE is a pillar for regulatory approval, but also is key to get access for the patients. So we all strive for the same. Um, and we also agree that RWE will pave the way for, um, RWE in rare will pave the way for, other, way for other areas as well. We also heard very honestly that there are constraints, right? There may be political constraints, there are data quality constraints which we have to overcome. And it was emphasized several times, the more transparency we have and the more we share our learnings, the more we can foster the field. There was, um, so there's a desire to collaborate instead of competing and um, with various uh, collaboration partners depend on the disease and the situations. We also talked a lot about the patient voice to include them as early as possible and to find innovative ways how to validate their outcomes which matter most for them. Um, because we are the creator of the data and the European court could be um, highly valuable. And the earlier we would start, the better it would be. And last but not by at least, we also said, look, the, let's use the digital world, digital epidemiology, patient-generated health data. They should be at the forefront to un better understand those super rare diseases. So um, thank you very much for bringing this all together and, um, uh, and have this lively discussion. So to close out, if ever uh, each of you would say one sentence, one super short sentence, what is your take from this webinar? So now I start with you. I'll say sharing, collaborating is going to enhance and unlock our potential for our patients. Thank you. Jill. Uh, thank you. As the same collaboration, coding and structuring the data and, and use the data for care and for research. Thank you. Jackie. I would say understanding the diversity of our population so that we can understand the unmet need and what really matters to these patients. Because at the end of the day, if we're not serving them, then we really aren't you know, accomplishing very much. Thank you. And Omar? 
strategic collaboration communication thank you and digital health <laughs> thank you very much thank you so much for which is very color. close to my arm so big yes. big thanks to this wonderful panel and also to this super audience with all the comments in the chat um, apologies we couldn't uh, tackle them all but we will and hopefully covered most of them big big thanks also to reuters for organizing it and um, have a lovely rest of the day thanks a lot thank you thank you thank, thank you, you have everyone. a good day bye bye